Hello and welcome to my latest podcast. Yesterday, the Irish government presented its long-awaited redress scheme to the former inmates of the mother and baby home system, a system that underpinned the cruel and unforgiving Magdalen scandal. As I read the government's document, I could not help but feel terribly sorry for the mother and baby home community. A community scarred not just by their time, short or long, within the home system, but being forced to endure incarceration without due process, separation from their children or mothers, and sanitary conditions, hard manual work, hunger, beatings, ill health, industrial schools, Magdalen laundries, being boarded out, illegal or illicit adoptions across countries and continents, failure of information, isolation, prevention of unification with their mothers or children, in one case I know for 48 years, some were never to meet, and worse, the deaths of their children, cynically disposed of within septic tanks or within the so-called cemeteries that surrounded these institutions. These are but some of the traumas suffered by this remarkable cohort of people. When you speak to those trapped within this system, and arguably still trapped, it does not matter how long they experience this carceral environment. Every single one of them can graphically detail the terror, abuse and sadness they experienced and continue to experience because of the successive failure of government and the religious institutions to acknowledge and accept their responsibility for the wrongs committed against their fellow citizens. And it is this key point. Every single one of them were born Irish citizens, and many have subsequently died as Irish citizens. Their constitutional rights trashed by highly questionable acts of the Oireachtas such as the Local Government Temporary Provisions Act of 1923, which classified unmarried pregnant women as offenders and unilaterally caused their incarceration within these Magdalen institutions, without any form of judicial process or public record. When I did read the scope and construction of the redress scheme for the mother and baby homes, I did not detect that the government had understood the scale of the trauma suffered by the men and women subjected to these horrors. That is not to say that the governments have not heard of these experiences. Irish society has over several decades now heard the evidence from thousands of people affected by those experiences, which was documented within the various commissions of investigation or public inquiries. Every inquiry has spawned a redress scheme that has proven to be divisive and generally unsatisfactory, because in the end, the schemes created have failed to deliver on the question of accountability. The Troubled Mother and Baby Home Commission of Investigation report delivered poor methodology and failed to receive, accept or publish evidence, producing a wide range of recommendations that are based on shaky foundations. The government's response to the publication of the report was lamentable, with attempts to lock away records for 70 years, thus producing a public backlash that caused them to retreat from their political decisions. The government rushed headlong into creating a burials bill that removes the role of the coroner and the right to an investigation. The normal expectations we have all come to accept where debts are discovered. The bill seeks to reinvent the wheel when in fact legislation already exists to help achieve the goal of exhumation of sites like Chewham and for a full inquiry into each individual's death to take place. That would be a demonstration of natural and public justice, but the government thinks otherwise. Now, such as the angst over this bill, cited as has been part of the survivor's redress, Academics, survivor groups, including myself with colleagues from Sally, the Separation, Appropriation and Loss Initiative, lawyers and even the United Nations 
have called the Irish government's headlong progress on the burials bill as deeply flawed. But still, the government is intent on doing its own way. Another arm of redress is the Information and Tracing Bill, again poorly constructed, attracting solid constructive criticism, offered in the hope that the government will have a change of heart. On the question of financial redress, along with my colleagues from Sally, we produced a paper to deal with this and a number of related factors. We even met with the consulting company appointed by the Irish government and laid out a very clear pathway that would cure the failures of the past through the construction of a new scheme. For example, we called for a universal payment system where everyone received the same payments and value without any time or age distinctions, commenced by an interim payment of €15,000. We railed against the traditional way of doing things, but cautioned the government that if they were more persuaded to do things the old way, then there should be no age or time distinction and that they should resist the temptation to introduce a tariff-based system. So what's wrong with the proposed mother and baby home redress scheme? Well, to begin with, my first overriding impression was that the Irish government have failed to learn the lessons taught them by the survivors. The scheme has been showcased as the most expensive package ever offered to survivors, offering some 800 million euro to satisfy the needs and objectives of the survivor community. As I read the redress scheme, it was clear that it was expertly PR package wrapped, but the detail reveals that it is simply not fit for purpose. I don't doubt that there will be some survivors who will consider the scheme to be adequate, but such feelings will be based on exhaustion and perhaps a desire to close as best as they can this profound chapter of their lives. I completely understand their point of view, but it cannot be said to be a ringing support of what has been produced. The majority of opinion I have heard so far has been disappointed, shocked and angry, and I can see why. The government has produced a table of figures which is best described as a tariff table, offering the very thing we advised against, time distinctions. From my perspective, this alone represents the legal way of doing things, of how you would manage group action claim for a distinct index event or claim. The mother and baby homes issue produces multiple indices and trauma, which is why the universal approach would have placed the scheme on more solid ground. The figures offered are derisory and do not reflect the norms that the trauma suffered, in other words, damages for pain, suffering and loss of amenity. But if we accept that the figure also fails to recognise the constitutional illegality of the survivor's incarceration, a new consideration comes into play, that of wrongful imprisonment. For example, in the United States, compensation for wrongful imprisonment runs in some states at $50,000 per year of incarceration, up to $200,000 per annum in Washington, D.C. The tariff table makes the mistake of creating distinctions through the time spent within the mother and baby or county institutions, thereby creating different classes of claimants and sending the message out that suffering is time limited. Is it any wonder that survivors with a lifetime of suffering and prejudice are so angry? The scheme also offers compensation for work carried out either within the institutions or outside in a commercial environment. The calculations offered have left me mystified and tend to suggest that the annual going rate for the first 11 years attracts a compensation rate of between €1,500 to just over €5,000 per annum. Compare that to my own grandmother's incarceration within the mother and baby home and Magdalen laundry system, 
where my own calculations show that she should have received a minimum of €8,000 per annum for the first 11 years of her incarceration and forced work without payment. As I was reading and considering this, I couldn't help but feel that an insurance mindset was at play. But the government was confident enough to produce these figures, or were they? Below the tariff table, the governments have included a legal waiver. In simple terms, they are saying, if you subscribe to this scheme, you cannot take legal action against us. Now, for most vulnerable survivors, disappointed by the construction of the scheme, this take-it-or-leave-it approach will be most, almost unbearable for them and will present them with an impossible decision. From my perspective, I think the governments are not entirely confident with their own figures, for if they were, there would be no legal waiver. They could confidently say, we know these figures are correct because this is what a court would order. We are so confident in our assessment, if you want to take us to court after you've applied to the scheme, go ahead. We believe the courts will agree with our assessment. But, of course, as we can see, they are insisting on a legal waiver. So perhaps not so confident after all. But instead of seeking to unify survivor and public opinion, the governments have added to the distinctions and removed categories of people from being able to apply to the scheme. For example, children who spent less than six months in these institutions and were subsequently adopted illegally or illicitly across borders and continents, they cannot claim. Children within institutions, like my own father, are not to be compensated for being boarded out. They can only claim for their time within the institution. Nothing at all about the onward trauma facilitated by the very institution in question. Women's suffering is, as I have already illustrated, time limited. Their pain of separation, a separation caused by these institutions across many years, is simply not recognised. Another focus of discrimination is that the government has completely disapplied those who died before the 31st of January 2021. Only those who died on or after that date, the date that the Taoiseach offered a state apology, an admission of liability perhaps, will be considered for compensation through their estates. Absolutely nothing at all for the many men and women who died before the Taoiseach's apology. The government claims that some 34,000 people will be eligible from the survivor community, but that depends how many survivors or their families will be made aware of the scheme. But if we assume at that best case scenario that some 30,000 applications are made, each receiving an average of 8,000 euro from the tariff table, that will cost the scheme 240 million euro. I calculated in this way because very few remained within these institutions for long periods. Many were sent elsewhere to serve their time. The cost of the enhanced medical card, though welcome to some 19,000 people, probably offers a facility for conditions and treatments that are already being catered for. It represents a diminishing use or call on its benefits. The whole scheme will be wrapped up in a new act of the Oroctus, and it is within that bill the devil of the detail will be seen. Overall, it feels weak and undynamic. It is an opportunity lost and will undoubtedly bring forth legal challenges without end, whatever about the understandable distress it has caused. On the question of weakness or a lack of dynamism, the final statement reveals that the minister has written to the religious orders, seeking them to meet, and I quote, to discuss how they might contribute to the scheme. Now, you would have thought that the government or the Oroctus would practice their legislative making abilities and create an act of the Oroctus to legally obligate the religious orders to pay substantial sums with appropriate sanctions if they don't. After all, 
You are lawmakers. You are in charge of the state, are you not? This published redress scheme is yet another milestone in the journey of the survivors. It represents power and the limitations that power can deliver. The state and the religious orders are engaged in a passionate tango, careful not to let the other slip, each movement carefully crafted. In the meantime, the tears of the scara fall on the dance floor. Until the next time, take care.